Hi, Cindy. Today we're going to start Chapter 4, the D Digestive System. It's very long, so there are two parts. What I'm going to do differently in this lecture is talk more about the anatomy and some of the procedures and spend less time in the actual code book. I believe by now you should have learned how to navigate that code book. You realize that you just have to read the code descriptions and don't stop reading too soon. Be sure you've read far enough that you know you're choosing the correct code. Before I get started, I wanted to show you something in my code book because I think sometimes students are a little afraid to write in their code books. And I received some feedback from a student recently and she told me how helpful it was for her to see my code book with the notes and tabs and the different things I had in there. So what I decided to do was show you a couple of pages from this section, the digestive system, and how I've notated some things and, and uh, made sure that I could see certain things. For example, these two codes, the, the big difference is this is a small intestine, this is a large intestine. But if you read it really quickly, you might miss that. The other thing I'm doing differently is I have the body system, the part of the body system that we're talking about in this case, uh, the intestines is in this column, and then uh, this column we have uh, Meckel's diverticulum, and down at the bottom the appendix. And then the appendix goes over, continues into the next page for a little bit, and then the colon and rectum starts. So this column would be the colon and rectum. But you see where I have uh, continued with my thought of circling a family of codes, and then highlighting whatever is different between those two codes. Uh, I make a point of here's a single, here's a multiple. That's a very easy mistake to make. So I'll usually write somewhere beside the multiple or the single just to bring my eye to that pretty quickly. This one, the difference is without a colostomy and with a colostomy. So I wrote with a colostomy. These two codes are back bench, which is cadaver work. Uh, things that happen on the back side. So I have this in here. Um, that's the main thing. I just wanted you to, to see how I write in my code book. Um, like here I have single tumor or polyp, single tumor or polyp, multiple polyps. And the techniques, you have to read the description to get your techniques. But in finding your technique, you might like see hot biopsy forceps and just jump on that code when in effect two polyps were removed. So then you'd need to be selecting this code with the multiple polyps with the hot bi biopsy forceps. So just don't be afraid to write in your book. I also make a distinction. These codes are proctosigmodoscopy. Then over here, when I get to this column, I'm starting the sigmodoscopy. And I highlighted the definition. That's all. Just wanted to show you a little bit more about uh, not to be afraid to write in that book. Okay, let's get started. Some facts to remember. If you recall from some of our previous, previous podcasts, we used the FTR acronym for facts to remember. The parts of the body that are covered under the digestive system are listed here, and they also would be those parts of the body that are a red font within this digestive system section. You also would see them on the table of contents. So different ways just to remind yourself what's in this section. What I think is particularly interesting, you'll see a, a question a little bit later, when we get to the uh, abdomen, the laparoscopic aspiration of an ovarian cyst, and instead of thinking of that as a female system, it falls in the CPT book under the abdomen. So just another way to maybe even make a little note, I think I will. I think in, in my table of contents for this section, I will write ovarian cyst beside abdomen just to help us remember. Let me show you that. And you can see right here where I've written ovarian cyst here beside the abdomen, peritoneum, and omentum. Okay. So an endoscopy should always be coded as far as the scope was passed. And that means when you are reading your operative report, it's going to tell you, the surgeon is going to dictate how far he or she advanced the scope into the 
digestive system. There are upper and lower endoscopies. You'll see those in your code book. And they're also differentiated between whether or not they were rigid or flexible, and that's referring to the scope itself and the approach. How did the physician get the scope into the body? An EGD is the short abbreviation for esophago gastro duodenoscopy. That is an upper GI and it involves the examination of the esophagus, the stomach, and the upper duodenum, or the jejunum. And EGDs are completed, I've given some reasons here why a physician might perform that procedure. And I also wanted to bring to your attention, there is no alphabetical entry for EGD. If you go to the index, you're not going to find EGD. You have to know what EGD stands for. esophago gastro Duodenoscopy, I can't say it quickly, but I do know what it means. If you think about what, what's happening here, the scope is being advanced down the esophagus, through the stomach, and to the duodenum, and it's a scope. So esophago gastro duodenoscopy, <laughs> or EGD. And I've given you here a few guidelines around that. It is appropriate to list multiple codes if your surgical report supports that. And also remember that if a physician is doing multiple procedures at the same time, at the same session, it's appropriate to link a modifier 51. While I'm thinking of that, let me show you something else in the code book that came to my attention recently. And that is Students are getting a little bit confused about the difference between these modifiers and these modifiers. These are for physician services. These are for facility services. And it says hospital outpatient use. But we need to remember this one. In fact, why don't we write MD for physician to help us remember that. Okay? That's Esophageal dilation, there's two methods for dilation, an endoscopic where the physician is inserting a balloon or a plastic dilator over a guide wire to stretch the esophagus, that's one code, or a manipulation that isn't using a scope and the surgeon's just passing a tapered dilating instrument through the mouth into the esophagus to dilate the esophagus. Boogies are types of um, instruments that you might use and here's two pictures that you can see I found these you know how I'm a big fan of Google Images I found these two on Google Images it shows you the Maloney and the Hearst and they are common as far as boogies that are used in esophageal dilation ERCP or an endoscopic retrograde cholangio pancreatography what I've done here is to just talk about the parts of the body that this is affecting what they do and why we're doing this procedure. The liver makes the bile. The gallbladder stores the bile until it's needed. The bile ducts carry the bile from the liver to the gallbladder and the small intestine. Then there's a pancreas that is producing chemicals that help with the digestion and it also produces insulin. So this is the parts of the digestive system that we are studying right now. Here is an anatomy lesson that you can see the stomach the gallbladder, how it hooks into the stomach there. The, what you're seeing coming down, that dark, that's the actual scope showing you how it might come down to do this procedure. And you see the pancreatic duct there. The jejunum is the beginning of the small intestine along with the duodenum. Duodenum comes first and then the jejunum. You've got the liver in the background, back behind the gallbladder. It's a good, good little diagram. I looked at some actual photographs on Google Images, but honestly, when I'm looking inside a body, I can't easily tell what I'm looking at. So I'm just going to, let's just say I'm not a surgeon, <laughs> so I'm just going to use a diagram like this because I can, to me, this makes more sense. And here's another diagram that talks about ERCP. It's combining the use of x-rays and a scope. So the physician can then see the inside of the stomach and the small intestine, inject dyes into those ducts that we were just looking at, so those ducts can be seen on x-ray. 
So let's do a problem. It's exercise 424, number 4. This is from your textbook. Okay, so let's do exercise 424, number 4, ERCP with removal of bile duct stones. You can try to do that one, and I'll give you the answer on the next slide. And there you go. Your main term is endoscopy, because that's the first the word in ERCP, the E is endoscopy or endoscopic and you are scoping the bile duct for the purpose of removing a stone. Stone is also known as a calculi. Two codes are given in the index and when I read this code descriptions 43264 was correct. Alright, let's talk for a bit about lower GIs. Now we're talking about procedures it says perform through a natural orifice. Now normally this is going to be the rectum or the anus and the reason why it makes that distinction is because there are codes for performing these procedures through a stoma. A stoma would be an artificial opening uh, uh, the surgeon has created. So here I've got how that exam follows and this is words taken from the code book. And here's an anatomy lesson where you can see the different parts of the colon where they lie in relation to the stomach, the liver, and then you see the colonoscope would be coming in from the anus, coming in up through the sigmoid, and we just keep going. And here is another diagram that just shows the colon, where the scope would come up through the rectum, through the sigmoid, up through the descending, through the splenic flexure, transverse colon, hepatic flexure, ascending colon. So a colonoscopy goes a lot further than a sigmoidoscopy or a proctosigmoidoscopy. Indications for a lower GI, I've got a couple of things there. And this is just another diagram that I pulled showing the colonoscope, which is the dark piece going up through the bowel. The nice thing about this particular diagram, it shows what the surgeon might find during a colonoscopy. He might see diverticulitis, she might see cancer or a polyp, a flat polyp or lesion, adhesions, which would be there from previous surgeries and just how the body healed, Ulcer ulcerative colitis, which is a very painful condition and appendicitis you might see because of the little appendix that's there at the end of where the scope is going. It is not unusual to have polyps on a, a normal a scope so they just watch them. I don't know anyone who hasn't had something on their colonoscopy report so it's just something that the doctor watches and when he's in there you, it also has in the middle here on our diagram Crohn's disease, which is another disease he would see the inflammation and, and the uh, ulceration of the walls of the intestine. This diagram shows us the difference between a colonoscopy and a sigmoidoscopy, where the blue is a colonoscopy. You see it goes much further than the green, which is the sigmoidoscopy. And here on the very end, going into the body, is the endoscope showing you that. So questions a coder might ask before assigning a code for an endoscopy is was the diagnostic endoscopy performed as part of the surgical and if so only the surgical is coded? What was its purpose and what approach was used so that your codes around that are going to be differentiated by your answers to these questions? Removing tumors or polyps, there are several ways and the four that our codes talk about are hot biopsy, forceps, bipolar cautery, or cauterizing, the snare, and a laser. When a laser is used, the coder is going to code ablation, not amenable to removal by the other three things. If a colonoscopy is incomplete, and that might happen if the doctor gets in there with the scope and it's got too much stool still in it, it wasn't a good preparation, or there's a disease that's obstructing the advancement of the scope, or the patient just can't tolerate it. Something's going on that he just, she or he can't tolerate the procedure. 
then you're going to be looking at some modifiers. And I made a distinction here so you could see what might happen, the difference between a reduced service, meaning this scope started in, but it could not go as far as it should have gone for a colonoscopy. That would be a reduced service. A discontinued procedure might be when the physician is doing the procedure, but the patient's just not tolerating it, and it just needs to stop. That would be a 53. And then the facility, in order to explain to the insurance company the charges, is going to show a modifier 73 if it's discontinued prior to anesthesia, and a modifier 74 if it's discontinued after anesthesia. So be really careful when you're looking at those two groups of modifiers on the inside back cover of your code book to be sure you're choosing the correct one. I have some information here about screening colonoscopies. If you are working in a doctor's office or an ambulatory surgery center and you're working a lot with Medicare patients, you will know how to bill these as well as having software in your practice that's going to take away uh, the 45378 CPT code and then give it a G code, but you still need to know that that's going to happen so that you can get paid for that if it's a Medicare patient. Then I have some information about coding guidelines for biopsies and lesion removals. And this is telling us when a biopsy is taken and the remaining portion of the same lesion is excised, in other words, you take the biopsy, of this lesion and then you go back in in the same session and think you know what I'm just going to take that whole lesion off. You're going to assign the code for the excision only. You're not going to assign the biopsy. And this language you would get that from reading the operative report and the pathology report that the doctor and the hospital is going to give you or the facility is going to give you. Likewise if one lesion is biopsied and a different lesion is excised, you're going to assign both the biopsy and a code for the excision. Now this is applicable unless the CPT code description includes the phrase with or without biopsy. You really have to read your code descriptions to be sure you're choosing the right one. If it says that, if it says with or without biopsy, you're only going to code the excision. It would be appropriate to append the biopsy code with a modifier 59 to show that you've got two different procedures in the same operative session where you've got one lesion biopsied and a different lesion excised. That's a modifier 59. The coder is going to get this information from the operative report and the pathology report. Also, you'll notice when you're reading your CPT codes, it will say with biopsy, single or multiple. When you have that code description, you're only going to use that code once, regardless of how many biopsies are taken, because your code description says single or multiple. An example I've chosen there is 45331, or a sigmoidoscopy with biopsy, single or multiple. No matter how many biopsies are taken, you would use that code once. So now let's look at an example. This is from your, your textbook, exercise 425, is operative report number two. A colonoscopy with a biopsy of polyps removed with hot biopsy forceps. And here's your answer. It would be colonoscopy flexible removal polyp. Another example. 424 number 2, a procto sigmoidoscopy with removal of polyps. You notice there's two polyps here, and when you look at these codes, you really have to watch because one says single polyp and another says multiple polyps. And because there were two polyps from your operative report, you would use the code for multiple polyps, and it's 45315. That's the end of, ch of uh, Chapter 4, Part 1. I'll be recording the next one very soon. Thank you.